Hello, uh, we're going to go through the answers to the May 2020 A-level physics exam for the International edX Cell paper for Unit 1 Mechanics and Material Materials. This is the exam that happened during COVID and I think this exam never actually took place in May but I think they used it for an October sitting. That's my understanding. At the time I wasn't teaching the syllabus but I would like to just go through my answers with you to allow you to understand how to answer these questions. These papers which I do is not just going through the answers, I try to explain the underlying concepts. So this is the paper that we're looking at. You may want to have a physical copy of your own when you're, do, when you're going through it and I will go through the multiple choice questions first. I'll try and keep the videos to uh, around 20 minutes if possible and then do repeat videos. So question one, it wants you to look at, so as you know this uh, syllabus has got 10 multiple choice questions and then longer questions and it's one hour and uh, 20 minutes long um, and there are four modules. So this is the first module normally taught between September and January and the exams are taken in January but you can retake them in um, future exam sittings. So this one is the unit one for May 2020. Okay, the first question, it wants you to look at which of the following units. So they're giving you four sets of units, joules, meters, newtons and watts. And just a quick way to say which of the units is only used with vertical quantities. So the way I've written it out for your benefit is that joules could be energy or work. Well, they're not. They're scalar quantities. They have no direction involved. Meters could be displacement, which is a vector, but it could also be distance. So it's not only used with vector quantities. So it's not B. C is force. So that's obviously pointing to the right answer. Force is always a vector quantity. And just to make sure you understand that watts is power. So Newton is the only one which is always uh, used for vector quantities. That's the first question. Question two is about forces. A box was placed on the top of a ramp and released. So a ramp, for those of you who are studying in the second language, is just a slope. So if you have a slope here, the top of the ramp would be here. So you have a box on the top of a ramp uh, and it was released. So presumably it's going to come downwards. Okay. So what's stopping it from coming downwards? The three body force diagrams for the box as it moved down the ramp at constant velocity is shown. So something is pulling it down, yes, but it's going at constant velocity, so something must be resisting the motion up the slope. Well, up the slope, yeah, would be this direction. So the slope is the opposite direction to what I drew, so the slope would actually be going downwards. The box is up there. The F and the D are representing air resistance and the frictional force. So obviously it's not a very smooth surface and there's no force down the, uh, the slope. The force is actually due to the weight and a component of the weight based on this angle will pull it down um, through gravity. Okay. Now the reaction then is at right angles to the contact between the box um, and the surface of the slope. So that's where the reaction comes, that's where the W comes, and F and D are resistive forces which act against its moving downwards. Okay. So which two forces acting on the box have, according to Newton's third law, corresponding forces on the ramp? So we're talking about Newton's third law, so you really need to know about Newton's third law. So if, first of all, I'm looking at F. Well, F could be a corresponding force. I don't see why not. F should be a corresponding force because F is a reaction to the object moving down the slope. Yes, yeah, so gravity is pulling it down the slope and the reaction to that is that there is uh, a frictional force in the reverse direction. So D, however, um, corresponding force is on the air not on the ramp. Yeah, so D is not 
a Newton's third law. So D is the air resistance. It's act, so it's to do with the air. So the corresponding force for um, would be on the air, okay? Not the ramp. So we want to know what force is acting on the ramp. So A is wrong. F and R, I put a tick beside them. We've said that F should be correct. R is the contact force acting on both objects. Yeah, the ramp and the box. Okay, so R is a reaction to the contact between the two objects. So it is a Newton's third law pair of forces. And F we've discussed already. W, the corresponding force for both the Ws, which means you can miss, you can ignore C and D. Yeah, although R is correct and one of them D is incorrect, as we mentioned before, the W, the corresponding force for the weight, is on the planet. So if the, if the planet, I'm sorry, I'm not actually showing you the answers. If the planet is pulling you down, your weight is the corresponding force on the planet. So only B can be correct because R is a contact force on both the objects, the ramp and the box. Okay? And the F acts between both objects. The frictional force is acts between both objects. So it is the corresponding Newton's third law force. Okay, sorry about that with the, the camera being slightly in the wrong position. Question three. It's a roller coaster. So this is about energy conversion. So the roller coaster car stops momentarily at the top of the slope P, where it has MGH 75. Um, is the height. Mass is per kilogram. We can ignore the mass because it's still got the same mass when it goes down. And then it wants you to uh, momentarily at P before descending down to Q, which is 30 meters. So 45 meters of the height difference is converted to kinetic energy. Again, we can do it for one kilogram, so you can miss out the MGH, miss out the M from MGH, G times H. G times H here, and here you can miss out if we do for one kilogram. So we do it per kilogram. Half one V squared will be half V squared. So which of the following expressions could be used to determine the velocity of the roller coaster at Q? So obviously the potential energy at P is equal to kinetic energy at Q. Some of it has gone to kinetic, so speed it up, and plus the potential energy at Q. Yes, remember we're doing per kilogram. So if you want to work out an expression that we could be used for velocity, you want kinetic energy on the left-hand side, the subject of the formula. And then, remember we're doing per kilogram, so you can then change that to half V squared. You can then do it to V squared, and then you can make the V equal to the square root of whatever V squared was equal to. So we know the potential energy at P is 75 meters times the gravity, and Mass is just one, so it doesn't really uh, equate, uh, need, need to be included in the equation. Minus 30 g is the potential energy per kilogram here. It will be equal to 45 g, the difference. So half v squared will be equal to, to half v squared will be 45 g. So v squared will be 90 g, and v will be the square root of 90 g, which means the answer must be d. Okay. Question four. A car travels north with a velocity uh, of 50 meters per second, and they're giving you a plus sign, so we'd have to think of it in terms of vectors. So u is, uh, is the initial velocity. While still traveling north, the car slows down to a velocity of 20 meters per second. So I put this as v and this is u. So which of the following is the change in velocity of the car? What change in velocity is v minus u? 20 minus 50 means it's slowed down, yeah, tells you. So the answer of 20 minus 50 gives you a change of velocity of minus 30 meters per second. So B is the correct answer, okay? Over the page, we're going to go to question 5, which is about vectors, okay? Now, remember with vectors, you need to be able to add one vector to the other, and you can do these uh, according to the method in the textbook. You have to be able to do them by scale drawing, or you can do them algebraically. In this case, 
a scale drawing or just a, a vector diagram is what you need to be able to do. So I'm just zooming out slightly to make it easier to see the question paper. Okay, so question five. You've got P going to the right, Q going down, so you've got to add P to Q. So all you've basically got to do is you've got to make a parallelogram of forces. So you add the Q onto there, yeah? You could also add the P onto there. You make the parallelogram of forces, and the resultant force is P plus Q. So this is equivalent vector to Q, yeah? So P plus Q, we're looking for a resultant vector pointing downwards from the black dot, so um, you, we can go through them. Well, this one they haven't done. They, they've, done they've done that, but the R is in the wrong direction. If you add P and Q, R should be downwards, not upwards. So these two have the direction wrong. This one, they've joined the end of P to end of Q, so they haven't actually added P and Q. Whereas here, they've done what I did. They've done P, added on the Q, and that the resultant force is downwards. So the only answer can be D. So, oh, the only answer is D. Okay? I'll just let you have a look at that to see that you'll see only D is the same as the diagram I drew at the top. Okay? So that's how you add vectors. You basically take one arrow and add it onto the head of the first arrow. Take the second arrow, Q, add it to the uh, base of the first arrow, P, and the answer will be where the beginning to the end arrows join up. Okay? Right. The next question is question six. And question six is about efficiency. So they've given us the efficiency is 0.68, which is 68%. But you don't need to use percentage. Fractional uh, efficiencies, maximum one would be 100%. Usefully transfers 120 joules of energy. So they're saying usefully transfers means this our useful output is 120 joules. Which of the following can be used to determine E, the energy supplied to the lamp? Well, if you know efficiency is useful output over energy input, yes, which is the energy supplied by the lamp, which is E, you can say that 120, this would be 120 over E. So changing the subject, the formula around, E would be 120 divided by efficiency. This is efficiency, yes, which is 0.68. So once you divide 120 by 6, 0.68, the answer will be T. Question 7 uh, is using a falling sphere to determine the acceleration of free fall. This is actually core practical one, so it's a required practical. You need to look at different ways that you can actually do this experiment in the lab, and you need to know the full method. Which two quantities would be required, would, would, would require the fewest measurements to take in order to determine G? Okay? Well, if it's got velocity, displacement, yes. You want to know how far the object is falling, yes. So you're basically just dropping a sphere. The initial velocity... We don't really need the initial velocity, but anything with velocity requires two measurements. You only need the time. Once you've got the time, you can work it out using the correct SUVAT equations. So only B requires two measurements. All the others, even if they could be done, and we don't need to discuss that, they require two measurements just for the velocity, so they require three measurements. So the one with the fewest measurements would be um, B. Okay, question eight is now about Young's modulus or uh, materials. So you need to have studied these equations. And uh, the stress is given by this uh, Greek letter sigma is applied across the ends of a wire of cross-sectional air. Area A, so sigma is force over area. Yeah. Work is done to extend the wire by delta x. Which of the following could be used to determine W? Now remember, W is equal to half F times delta X. If you had a graph of F against delta X and it was obeying Hooke's law, then the area under the graph is half the maximum F times the extension, the total extension, because it's the area of a triangle. So that area is the work done. 
is half fx. Okay? So once you know that, they want you to give it to in terms of stress. Well, force is stress times area, rearranging that equation. So half stress times area substituted into this equation times delta x, and you'll see the only answer is c. Hope that makes sense. You can pause the video at any stage to take a deeper look at the questions. Okay, the next question is question 9. Question 9 and 10 is, is using the same information. The velocity time graph for the motion of a ball is shown. Yeah, so the velocity is speeding up. Then something happens. It rebounds suddenly and has the opposite velocity. Yeah, so for those of you familiar with these graphs, you'll know that this is a bouncing ball. Okay, it speeds up as you drop it, hits the ground, suddenly reverses direction, very small time difference. It does not come to the same height because the velocity here is smaller than the velocity before the bounce. Before the bounce, just after the bounce, the gradient gives you the acceleration. You will notice the gradients are equal. Okay, so it's the motion of a ball acted upon by gravity. Which of the following correctly describes the motion of the ball? The ball is dropped and rebounds to its original position. No, if it was original position, it would have reached the same velocity and it would have been a completely elastic collision. So yes, it rebounds. No, it doesn't reach the original position. B is correct. The ball is dropped and rebounds to a lower position. Lower position means it had a lower velocity after the bounce, so it couldn't get to the same height. So B is the answer. Okay, and you can see there is no rebound in these equations. It's saying that the ball is, is thrown upwards and caught. Well, if that was the case, it wouldn't suddenly change uh, velocity so quickly. It wouldn't be a rebound thing. Uh, it would be a different shape graph. Okay, so B is the answer. Question 10. Which of the following graphs of displacement against time could represent the motion of the ball? Okay. So, you've got, to, you've got to understand that displacement is always positive because you're always above the ground. So you're always above the zero point. Okay. Now, initially it speeds up and then it bounces um, at the same point on the time axis and it's then decreasing uh, its displacement. Okay. The displacement starts at the maximum value. So here is when it's reached the ground. So the maximum displacement is reached when it hits the ground. It then loses, uh, it reverses direction and goes the other way. So uh, C speeds up, slows down, moving up, and it shows the bounce. Of course, it can't be exactly the same shape graph. It needs to be a curve because the speed, it shows that just the curve on displacement graph shows that is speeding up, okay? And then this curve shows that it's slowing down, whereas straight line graphs don't do that. Must show a change in velocity, and it's a curve that shows a change in velocity. Well, that means the answer must be C, and that is the end of the multiple choice section of this paper, and it's taken just under 20 minutes. So we're going to stop there, and I will do answers videos for the following questions. Please like and share if you want uh, if you can and if you want to know when the next video is ready subscribe and you will see you'll be notified when the next video is prepared thank you very much for your time